ladies, we're gonna get started again. <laughs> Round two, here we go. Let's do it. All right, so like I was saying, um, he, Jesus is a really good storyteller. He always, like, he always illustrates things by stories or by using symbolism, bringing out people in front of him. Um, and so he brings out a child and yeah, it's kind of fun doing both at the same time. All right, let's see if I can do, there we go. Um, is there text? Okay, so that's what we just read. So he, he puts this child in the midst of them. And this is really interesting that he would, he would put a child, y'all can come in, um, in the midst of them for a couple of reasons. So children were regarded as the least in society um, in the Jewish culture. One commentary says a child represented someone completely reliant on others, perhaps even a burden. Children were not, I'm sorry, children were without status in the ancient wor world and at the mercy of adults. And another commentary says a child was a person of no importance in Jewish society, subject to the authority of, its, of, its, of his elders, not taken seriously except as a responsibility. The child was one to be looked after, not one to be looked up to. To turn and become like children, therefore, is a radical reorientation from the mentality of the rat race to an acceptance of insignificance. So he kind of flips this on its head. They're assuming we're the, one of us is the greatest. And he's like, no, no, no. It's totally counterintuitive to what you would think it is. It's actually the most insignificant in the society. He's saying, this is, this is the greatest. And so he elevates the least among them, which we see him often do in his earthly ministry. Um, he's telling them that their ideas and their framework of what greatness and grandiosity is, is actually wrong. Um, and, you know, scholars are divided on whether or not, um, Jesus is saying here that the greatest in the kingdom are physically children. Like, are the children the ones that are the greatest in the kingdom? Or is it the ones who, is it anybody um, that becomes like a child, right? And we see in this text, he, um, he's referring to believers whose faith is characterized by childlike simplicity. And we know this because he later in this text says, whoever humbles himself. So he's not simply saying, only the children are the best in the kingdom and sorry, because we can't, I mean, I physically can't become a child again, right? We can't physically become children again. But what he's saying is we can turn and in humility recognize our need um, and, our, and to rely on God. Um, and so it is first and foremost for salvation, right? We, we cry out to God that we need a savior and we need salvation. Um, and we recognize our need for a savior. Um, but then it's also a daily opportunity and a discipline for us to recognize every day that we need God and to rely on him. Um, and there's humility in that. Um, and we have to intentionally reject the world's ideas um, of greatness and recognize that greatness comes from, um, from and in relying on God. That's where greatness comes from. Um, and this is counterintuitive to our very nature and especially our culture. Um, in our culture, we value independence and strength and not needing anyone. Um, we saw this last week in Texas, right? Um, because we as Texans love our independence um, because we don't share our electrical grid with anybody else. <laughs> we had a disaster last week. And I don't say that. Um, I know it's not that simple. And I don't say it to make light of last week. Um, but rather to say we love our independence. And Jesus is actually saying the opposite is where greatness is found, is relying on God um, for all of our needs. So that's the beginning of 18. We're going to keep going. Um, all right. So 18 verses five and six, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Um, so again, he's using little ones and child synonymously. Um, so he's not simply talking about a young child. He's talking about those who have placed their faith in Christ. And we'll see this throughout the whole chapter. So you'll hear this again and again. It's a repeated theme. Um, and we've established that this means a person that is dependent upon Jesus. Um, Jesus says, and in this, Jesus says that when somebody receives a believer um, who is dependent upon God, one of these little ones, he, they're actually receiving him. So he's identifying 
with his children here. Um, and this shows us that he closely identifies with us as believers. Um, he then issues a warning about anyone who would cause one of these believers to sin. He takes it personally because he identifies with us. Um, and he says that if someone intentionally causes one of his children to sin, it would actually be better that they drown violently. Um, and this shows us a couple things. And we're going to see this throughout the rest of the, the chapter. One, Jesus, we're, we see Jesus's care and how deeply um, and intimately he identifies with his children. That's the first thing. The second thing is how seriously he takes sin. And the third thing is how serious, how serious it is to cause someone else to sin. Um, and again, we'll see this throughout the rest of the chapter, kind of woven in. Um, okay, so he's going to continue on his monologue about temptation, um, starting in verse 7. Woe to the world for temptations to sin, for it is necessary that temptation come, but woe to the one whom, by whom the temptation comes. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life um, with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell of fire. Um, so we see another warning. And this time we see a woe given. And we see, um, we, we see woes given elsewhere in scripture, oftentimes to the religious leaders. Um, and they are like oftentimes warnings, condemnations. Um, they're, they're a warning. Um, and... Um, so he gives us that warning, and then he says, temptation's going to come because we live in a fallen world, right? Because sin is in our world, our, sin, our world is rife with sin, temptation naturally comes in our world, um, and, and temptation isn't necessarily wrong itself, right? We know that Jesus was tempted um, without sin, and so temptation in itself is not wrong, um, but he's saying that because of the fallen world we live in, temptation is going to come. Um, but he warns the one whom the temptation comes by. Um, and he's speaking kind of vaguely here at first. And um, it's like if, you know, if he's, if I'm speaking to the whole room and then I turn my direction on Rachel and I, then I start speaking to her. So that's the transition that happens. He goes from talking temptation generally, and then he goes directly and he says, Hey, Rachel, if your hand causes you to sin or if your foot causes you to sin. So he, he moves from general temptation to sin to first person temptation to sin. So now it's personal. Now he's talking directly to the, to us and to the disciples. Um, and he says, if your hand causes you to sin. Um, so what he's saying here is that if there's anything in our lives that is causing us to sin, Meaning, if there's an active agent in our life that's tempting us to sin, then we need to, um, we need to cut it out of our life. Um, and he goes on to say that this is, it would actually be better to enter into life for eternity um, without a ligament than to be separated from him forever. Um, so he uses, again, he loves imagery and illustrations. And so he's using hands, feet, our eyes as examples of what we might need to tear off. Um, to keep us from sinning. Um, and so again, what we, what we see here is Jesus is highlighting the seriousness of sin. He takes sin really seriously. And most of the time, I don't know about you guys, but anytime I've heard this text taught, um, usually the, the teacher is like, will say something like, you know, make sure don't, you know, don't go, don't go actually cut your arm off or don't go actually pluck your eye out. Right. Um, and, you know, Jesus didn't mean this literally. Um, and I agree with, I, please don't go home and cut your leg off and say, Kelsey and Jesus told me to do that. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. Um, but I think because oftentimes we, um, we talk about that he's not speaking literally here, we neglect to uh, pay attention to the things that he is asking us to walk away from. Um, that he is asking us, even though he is using hyperbolic language, that doesn't negate the seriousness of these agents of temptation that he is talking about. Um, so I think we can justify continuing in the things that actually do causing us, do cause us to sin by not taking, we justify that his words aren't literal or whatever. And we don't take that seriously. And we don't justify it. And I think we need to. Um, so a couple of years ago, I was really, and I was in a season where I was really 
doubting God's goodness in my life and, um, uh, and specifically in singleness. And um, I was really doubting that he could be trusted, that he was faithful and that he was good. And um, it, was, it was a long season of my life where I felt like he put me, he allowed me to be in a really dark place where I had to wrestle through those things with him. And in that season, um, that year, I did these New Year's resolutions where every month I would give something different up every single month. So, you know, January gave up sweets or whatever. And, you know, February gave up social media, whatever it was. And I remember I was, it was early in the year and I think March, I decided to give up romantic comedies. And, um, and the reason, the reason for that was because I, anytime I had a bad day, which was pretty much every day that year, <laughs> um, in that season, I would come home and eat pizza and watch a romantic comedy, right? Like that's how I was comforting myself. And, um, and so I gave it up for New Year's for that month. And I ended up giving up romantic comedies for about six months because I realized, um, I realized the ways that I, you know, when you're struggling in singleness, watching romanticized versions of love might not be the best thing for you. Um, fake romanticized Hollywood version of love. It wasn't healthy for me. It wasn't, it wasn't good for my heart. It was causing me, it was perpetuating this lie in my life that God wasn't good. And that he couldn't be trusted and that he was holding something from me. So rom-coms are not inherently wrong. Some are. Some we should not be watching. <laughs> but, but in themselves, they are inherently wrong. But for me in that season of my life, they, they, weren't, they were not helping me love Jesus more. Come on in. You're fine. There's a couple of chairs up here. There's, there's one right here, front and center. Um, so yeah, so romantic comedies, they, they are not inherently wrong in themselves. But in that season they were causing me to sin. They were, they were an agent of temptation in my life. And I didn't realize that until I gave it up and realized, wow, that was really feeding something where I was doubting God's goodness. And I was running away from him because I felt like he was withholding something from me. Um, first Corinthians six twelve says, everything is permissible for me, but not everything's beneficial. Everything's permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Um, and so whatever it is, like if for, for me, it was rom-coms in that season. Um, it rom-coms, like I said, are not inherently sinful, but they weren't beneficial to me. They were permissible, right? But they weren't beneficial. And so I had, to, that was good for my soul to step away from those. So I don't know what it is for you. It might be romantic comedies. It might not be. Um, it might be a dating app that might not be good for your, your soul right now. Um, it might be and um, the way you're working out, working out honors God and we should steward our bodies in a way that is honoring to him. But it might be an obsessive workout routine. It might be the way that you're eating. You might be overeating. You might be starving yourself. Like, And so invite others into that to have some accountability. We're going to talk a little bit more about accountability because um, I think this text lends itself to it. Um, but I don't know what it is. It could be um, shopping. Shopping's not wrong. Things aren't wrong. Um, but it could be alcohol. It could be social media. So I don't know what it is, but I think oftentimes we hear this text and we think, well, Jesus isn't taking, isn't saying that literally. So we just justify and, and we don't take seriously that he's calling us to cut our, you know, metaphorical arm off, which was for me, a romantic comedies for a while. So, um, I would love for you guys to consider what that might be in your own life. Um, and, and Jesus is saying it's better for you to cut that out of your life and get rid of it. Just it's just better. Um, and I can say it, that season of my life, I saw the fruit of that and the way that I began to trust God. Um, so I would love for you to consider what that might be. Okay, so we're finally at the parable, <laughs> um, and I really think and hope that this long detour detour will be worth it once we get to it and we kind of understand the context of it. So we saw how seriously Jesus takes sin, and now we're going to see God's heart for the one who has been tempted and lost. All right, so let's see. Okay, so uh, verse 10, see that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my father who is in heaven. 
what do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it truly, I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 that never went astray. So it is not the will of my father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Um, so again, he references um, the little one, the little ones, which we know we've established are believers who have trusted in God um, and who rely on God. Um, and I'm not going to spend too much time focusing on um, the tidbit about angels. It's interesting. If you want to go study it, it's really interesting. But um, scholars, there, there's arguments. Some people think that this means we have guardian angels, but Every, you know, every individual person, some people think have guardian angels. I don't think the text supports that. I don't think scripture supports that. Um, I, we learn in Hebrews that angels are concerned for believers and they serve them. Um, so Jesus' words here are appropriate, even if we cannot be sure of all the specific ways in which angels ministers to us. So don't let that derail you. But it is interesting if you want to go study it. Um, so specifically our parable. In your homework this week, you saw the differences, hopefully either this week or last week, um, you, you got to the homework and you got to see the differences in the Luke account and the Matthew account. Um, so we're going to kind of talk about some of those differences. Um, in the Luke account, Jesus directs his question to them. Um, I'm sorry, let me back up. Um, so one of, the audi- one of the differences is the audience. So the audience in Luke is to non-believers. So it's to tax collectors, sinners, Pharisees, scribes. That's his audience. That's who he's talking to. So these are two different accounts. Same story, two different accounts. Um, And then the one in Matthew is to the little ones, the believers. He's directly talking to the disciples. Um, And so different audience. Um, And in the Luke account, Jesus directs his question to them, making the audience, the, the Pharisees, the tax collectors, the sinners, the scribes, he makes them the main character of the story. Um, whereas in um, Matthew, he, he sets a story up as the man is someone else, not necessarily them. Um, but Jesus poses the question in both accounts as a rhetorical question, not expecting them to answer, um, but knowing that everyone understood the answer to be yes, absolutely. The lost sheep, the shepherd's going to go after them. That's the rhetorical understanding of um, what would have happened, what would have taken place. Um, so in both of the stories, the shepherd would always go after the one sheep who is lost, lost and they know that. Um, so this being an agrarian society, they would have been well acquainted with sheep and shepherds. Um, I don't know about y'all, I'm from a suburb and I'm a city girl. <laughs> and so she, when, when it's anything talking about agrarian society, it's over my head. Um, and so uh, they, I don't understand this immediately, but they would have, they would have been really familiar with it. Um, and so if you've heard any teaching on sheep or shepherds, I'm sure you've heard that sheep are dumb animals. Um, and t- as Tim Keller says, this is a well-placed spiritual insult to be called a sheep is to be called helpless and, and dumb. Um, and Jesus isn't calling us dumb, but he's, he's, um, the sheep are known as helpless Um, And one commentary describes sheep this way. When a sheep is cut off from the flock, it becomes bewildered. It lies down, unwilling to move, waiting for the shepherd. When the shepherd finds it, he has to put it on his shoulders and carry it back to the flock. It's really beautiful imagery. Um, And so what Jesus is communicating in both Matthew and Luke, even though they're different audiences, talking about a different person that's lost, um, we see that God loves and pursues those who are far from him, Um, whether that is those who are far from him currently eternally, so the person that's lost, that's not yet a believer, or or the person that in that very moment, because of temptation, they are astray, they're they're away from God, Um, like we see in Matthew. So we're going to, we're going to shift our focus back to the Matthew account. So the Matthew, in the Matthew account, the lost sheep is a believer. And we know that again, because he's talking about the little ones. Um, so positionally, if you are in Christ, you're, you're always in Christ. Um, this isn't saying that <laughs> the, the one that's in Christ can be lost. That's not what he's saying here. But as we know, as we've just studied the context, temptation is real. We live in a fallen world, right? The romantic comedies or whatever it is, it can be agents of temptation, can be agents of sin um, 
to draw our hearts to not trust God, to be, to walk away from him, right? Not eternally, but um, we can be led astray by the things that are tempting to us, right? Um, and so, uh, So this shows us how far God goes to rescue and call his beloved back from temptation and sin. Um, Temptation and sin can't separate you because of Christ, Um, but it's showing us again how serious Jesus takes sin and the links at which God goes to restore and bring back his children to himself. Um, And so we've seen in the first half of Matthew 18, Jesus' warning to the disciples about temptation, the seriousness of sin. And now he's illustrating God's pursuit when we do go astray. Um, And in in a second, we're going to see how he actually invites us as believers in to pursuing others, other believers who also have gone astray. So we'll see that in a second. Um, And so when the one sheep, the lost sheep is brought back, he is rejoiced over even more than the one who never went astray. So Jesus is revealing God's heart and his pursuit of of his children here. Um, You also looked at John 10 and Ezekiel 34 in your homework. homework. Um, And I I was really excited to teach this topic specifically um, because I love John 10 and love Ezekiel 34. And I hope when you studied it this week, you saw the beautiful imagery and um, I hope you loved it as much as I did. Um, And in Ezekiel 34, the Lord is indicting the leaders of Israel for neglecting the very people God intended for them to care for. He set up leaders among above the of above Israel to care for them and they failed. I I keep forgetting to switch these. Okay, so we're going to read some of Ezekiel 34. Um, This is a this is a a a woe. It's um, a condemnation, if you will. It's a prophecy. Um, but he's, he set up these, um, Israel, the people of God, he set up leaders above them and his intention for them was for these leaders, these shepherds to care for his people. And they didn't, they failed. Um, and they, he's indicting them for neglecting the very, the very people he intended for them to care for. Um, So the metaphor of shepherds as the rulers of the community would have been well known to this audience as it has ancient roots and was widespread in the Near East. Um, So he set them up to care for them. And yet Ezekiel's prophecy is describing how the shepherds misuse their power by using it for their own gain than rather rather than the good of the people. So let's read Ezekiel 34. Um, The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus say the Lord Thus says the Lord God, ah, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourself, should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourself with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones, you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, the force and harshness you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd and then became food for all the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered. They were want, they wandered all over the mountains and on every high hill. My sheep were scattered over all the face of the earth with none to search or seek for them. I don't know about y'all, but I love the Old Testament and literally every book is just crying out for Jesus, right? Like we sit on the other side of the cross and so we know Jesus and we know his character and we know John 10. And this, like, this is a job description for Jesus, only Jesus, Right. And all like, these are the, this is the failure of Israel and the leaders God has appointed. And Jesus steps in as, as the better shepherd, right? And we're going to see that in John 10. Um, so, so yeah, so the shepherds misused their power and they didn't, um, they didn't care for the people God intended for them to care for. And this passage is emphatic that the role of the shepherds to ensure the safety and the well-being of the flock And this was the distinctive failure of Israel's leaders. Um, And so this is a weighty judgment on the leaders of Israel. And God says, and we'll read this in a second, because the Israelites have failed, he himself would come and actually rescue his flocks. He himself would set up one shepherd over them, a better and a perfect shepherd. So we'll read this. Um, For thus says the Lord God. Oh, oh yeah, that's right. 
I thought I did the same side slide twice. Uh, for thus says the Lord God, behold, I myself will search out my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep. And I will rescue them from all the places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel um, by the ravines and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them with good pasture and on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. There they shall lie down in good grazing land and on rich pasture they will feed on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost and I will bring back the straight and I will bind up the injured and I will strengthen the weak and the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. I will rescue my flock. They shall no longer be a prey, be prey. I will judge between the sheep and the sheep, and I will set over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. Um, he shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be prince among them. I am the Lord, I have spoken. Um, and so, again, this is crying out for Jesus. And so when Jesus comes on the scene um, in John 10, which we're going to read next, hopefully you've studied this week, He's saying, this is me. I'm the fulfillment of this prophecy. I'm the only one that could do this. Um, so John 10, I'm the good shepherd. The good, this is Jesus speaking. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He, fleed, he flees because he has a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father, I lay down my life for the sheep and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. There will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, my father loves me because I lay my, down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my father. So this is a totally different description of the leaders of Israel, right? That fed themselves for first, that only protected themselves. This is Jesus saying, no, I laid, I laid down my life for the sheep. Um, and this is the character of God as Jesus is telling this parable, but they would have known this imagery of Ezekiel 34 um, that these shepherds had failed to do. And Jesus is saying, this is the heart of God and this is who I am. Um, and as Tim Keller beautifully tells us, the reason Jesus is able to seek and save the life, save the lost is because, um, because he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf, right? And that we might become the righteous of God. Um, and I don't know if you noticed this or not, but there isn't a verse 11 in your Bible, Matthew 18, 11. It's, it, it might be there and it might be bracketed and it might say, you know, not in the earliest manuscript. So they, they removed it um, from a lot of the Bibles um, because it wasn't in the earliest manuscripts. But that verse did say the son of man came to seek and save the lost. And Jesus says that elsewhere about himself. So it's still true, even if it's um, been removed because it wasn't in the earliest manuscript. Um, but he's showing us that he is the reliable shepherd who seeks and saves the lost. Um, and so, again, like Tim Keller says, the reason he is able to seek and save the lost is because he actually entered in. He became like us. He became sin who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteous of God. Um, I love the way that Isaiah says this. Um, it says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity, iniquity of us all. And then Jesus is shown here kind of as a sheep, um, as a lamb. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. And like a sheep that is before it, before it shears is silent. Um, and so he actually entered in and became like us. And so he's showing us God's heart for the one who is... Um, it is astray and he's entered in and he's actually done something about it. Um, and he, um, yeah, he became like us and took his punish, took our punishment on himself so we could be with him forever. And this is why he is a good, perfect, trustworthy, reliable shepherd. No one else lays their life down for the sheep. And then the rest of 18, we won't read. Um, but the section immediately following the par parable is often called the church discipline section. Um, and so it's the process that churches use um, to walk people through church discipline. And um, believers 
should and do use it for conflict. Um, and the hope of it, again, this whole chapter is trying to communicate the same thing, that God wants his people to be restored back to himself. So if there's temptation or if there's sin, he wants, he's giving us processes, he's given us models to bring us back to himself. And um, the hope is that with this, with Matthew 18, the hope in all of that is that any believer who is in sin, that they would be restored completely back to God and to, and to fellowship. Um, and Jesus gives us a process to go through. And what I love about this is he gives us ownership in this and he entrusts this process to us. So just like I was talking about earlier with temptation to sin, whatever that is in your life, if you, um, if you have a friend in your life, that's that you see living in sin or you see to agents of temptation, like God puts the onus on us now because we have been, um, cause the good shepherd has gone after us and has brought us back to himself. Now he puts it on us and tells us to go out and bring people back. Um, and he, yeah, he entrusts this process to us, just like he entrusted it to the Israelite leaders and they failed. Um, and so Jesus stepped in as the perfect shepherd and did what nobody could do. Um, including, I mean, offering salvation and seeking you and I, right. Um, and now he hands the baton to us. Um, and so I, when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about in Genesis, when Cain kills Abel, um, God comes to him and says, hey, where's your brother? And he's like, well, am I my brother's keeper? And God's like, yeah, you are. <laughs> and so I think similarly for us, we now get to be the brother. We, we are each other's, we are sister's keepers. We're brother's keepers. Like we, God has given us um, he's put it on us to help one another recognize temptation and sin in our life and to bring people back as the good shepherd has brought us back. Right. And then, so now we get to do that for one another. Um, and I love the summary and the homework, and this is where we'll finish. Um, I think Kay wrote this, who wrote the, um, the homework and she's incredible. Um, and it says, these parables are a reminder of the infinite links to which God will go to rescue his own and keep them in his care. We are reminded that God doesn't just seek those who are lost outside the family of God, but that he also cares about the insignificant, marginalized people within the church. Jesus is asking us not only to understand the character of God, but to emulate it, being Christians who seek out those who are in need of his grace, help them to experience it and rejoice with them when they do. Um, I'll pray for us. And then let's see, which groups are in here? Claire's, in, Claire's group is in here and Leah and Jennifer's group are in here. And then the other two groups, you can go to those two rooms. It doesn't matter which one. Okay, I'll pray. God, thanks so much um, for the beautiful weather this week and um, getting to enjoy you through creation. And thanks for bringing us here together and getting to study your word and, um, and being a God who goes after us and loves us and pursues us continually, not just once um, for eternity, but all the time um, and for giving us the opportunity to do that for one another and, um, and getting to love one another and emulate your character as, as the homework talked about. Um, we're, we're just grateful and um, we just pray for our time that it would be encouraging and edifying and um, yeah, that you would just be honored in all of it. Um, Jesus, we love you a ton and we know that we only love you because you first loved us. And so it's in your name that we ask all this, amen. Thank you.